Good morning, friends. Good morning, Pastor Riley. How are you this morning? I am great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the Presbyterian New England Congregational Church. We are so glad that you are able to join us for worship this morning. It is a little bit of a dreary day, um, but my hope is that we can all take a deep breath and feel the light of God's love in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, in our souls, that we can be present for this time of worship. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this virtual space in this faith community. Let us now prepare ourselves for worship. This morning, I would like to call us into worship with the words of the prophet Jeremiah and his call narrative. I would invite you just to repeat after me. Do not say I am only a child. Do not say I am only a child. But you must go. But you must go. And you must speak. And you must speak. Whatever I command you. Whatever I command you. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For I, the Lord, am with you. For I, the Lord, am with you. And I will deliver you. And I will deliver you. Amen. Amen. 
And as part of our coming into this, this posture in this space of worship, we pray a prayer of invocation. And so I invite you to pray with me. Most holy God, God of the prophets, God of the rebel rousers, God of the saints, and God of even us. We come into this space and into this time and set our hearts to worship. We welcome you into our hearts and acknowledge that you have been there all along. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Riley. Friends, I invite you now to join with me in our prayer of confession. Covenant-making God, you use every possible means to reach us, breathing your spirit in us, calling us by name, showing us symbols of your promise, offering us a new way of life. We confess that our hearts are hardened. We choose certainty over faith, anxiety over courage, independence over compassion. We turn our eyes from our neighbors in need and from stories of despair and from pleas for peace and from anything that might bring tears to our eyes for we prefer our own comfort. We get caught up in our own needs and desires and forget you have made us to be your people together. Engrave your word on our hard hearts again, O oh God. Then break them open for what breaks yours, that your word might sink in and become a part of us so we might truly live as if you are our God and we are your people. We pray in the name of the one whose love breaks all bounds, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, the good news is this, God who has begun a good work in us will not leave us to toil in vain. We are forgiven, we are loved, and we are welcomed home into the family of God. So friends, since we have been reconciled in Christ, let us reconcile with one another. The peace of God be with you. And also with you. Thank you, friends. You are invited to pass the peace in our chat box at this time. This morning for our children's message, I talked about my stole that I received for ordination. But this, but I'm going to talk to you all online here about this this keychain here this is my house key and it was given to me on the first anniversary of my spouse and I or my soon-to-be spouse and I uh the, the anniversary of our first year of dating and this is a key to her house and I hadn't I didn't move in yet so it was a pretty symbolic gesture but what's more important is this this little keychain and it says, you are enough on one side. And then on the other side, it says, beautiful, loved, enough. And I, I, I like this. And I keep it in my pocket. And um, it's, it's handy to have my house key. But also as a reminder of, of who I am 
who Rachel sees me as, who God sees me as, I, I am enough just the way I am. And there are little, little tokens and little things in our lives that serve as those reminders or, or those little items that make us brave. Maybe it's my stole that I wear when I preach or my keychain that I keep in my pocket. Maybe you have a, a particular stone or um, a figurine or a stuffy or a t-shirt or something that makes you feel brave and reminds you of, of who you are and how amazing you are and makes you feel the most you that you ever feel. And it's important to have those things. And I, and I think we have those things as a gift from God to re, as reminders of God's presence and who God created us to be. Because sometimes we forget and sometimes we get scared and sometimes we're afraid of what people think of us. But the most important thing is that we are invited to be our whole selves because God loves us and created us with such intention. And so whatever, whatever little reminder you need to remember who you are and that you can be brave, I hope, I hope you have a thing like that. Let's pray together this morning and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for making me just the way I am. Thank you for loving me just the way I am. Thank you for being with me. And thank you for reminders that I can be brave because that's how you made me. Amen. In the days to come, the peoples all will stream to the holy mountain of the Lord to embrace as one the prophet's ancient dream that the nations will learn more no more. On the day when we beat our swords to plowshares, on the day when we throw the spear no Oh,
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And the, wor- the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priest who were in Anoth, the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came, and the king of Josiah, son of Ammon and Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It also, and it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah and Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet among the nations. And then I said, Ah, Lord, I truly do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy and triune God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The way that we pick scripture passages is from a thing called the lectionary. And the lectionary right now is taking us into a six-week study on Jeremiah. As my sermon will allude to later, Jeremiah is not necessarily a welcome summer kind of book. So I am preaching on Jeremiah this morning because I love this passage. Our guest preacher next week will also be preaching on Jeremiah. And then from there out, we're just going to wing it. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So the call narrative of Jeremiah, as you might have anticipated, is very dear to me. I made the decision to go to seminary during that summer camp summer where the summer theme was speak it. All summer long, I was telling kids to be brave and to speak their truth as people of faith. I have clung to Jeremiah, co-opting this call narrative, hearing God say these words to me. I went to a seminary full of second career students. I was often by far far the youngest person in my classes. Do not say, I am only a child, God said to me. And I was a closeted queer in an unaffirming denomination, and God said to me, I am with you. I will rescue you. I had these verses read at my ordination, and when I told the preacher what the passage was, his response was, you do know what happens to Jeremiah, right? And after what has struck, always struck me as a mystical, powerful encounter with God, Jeremiah spends his career being ignored by a hostile administration and harassed by angry mobs. The king is more concerned with, with amassing wealth than he has with justice. The people are fully enmeshed in the pagan worship of their neighbors. God's laws call for them to take care of widows and orphans and immigrants, and yet these vulnerable are abused and mistreated. Jeremiah warns that God will send Babylon as a tool of God's anger for the unrighteousness in the land. As you can imagine, Jeremiah was not a popular figure. After issuing months and years of warnings that fall on deaf and indignant ears, Babylon does indeed invade. Jeremiah watches as they burn his beloved Jerusalem and tear down her temple. The king is taken into captivity. Somewhere in the middle of all of this, Jeremiah is actually kidnapped and dropped off into Egypt in hopes that will shut him up. 
Spoiler, it doesn't work. He returns just in time to see the city's final destruction. All these terrible things happen to Jeremiah. Futile warnings preached to angry audiences. Kidnapped by his own people. The trauma of witnessing devastation that theoretically could have been avoided. So what about God's promise of presence and rescue? How we answer this question matters because of our relationship to our holy scriptures. God invites us through the teachings of Jesus to trust what we read in the Bible. That, we are, that if we hold tight to God's word, it will bless us. It will show us the best way to live. Throughout the scriptures, we find stories and songs that extol the promises of God. We take these promises that God has made to our spiritual ancestors and apply them to ourselves. Let's call this the transitive property of Holy Covenant. When God tells Jeremiah not to fear, we hear God telling us not to fear. When God tells Jeremiah that he will be rescued, we hear God telling us that we will be rescued. What happens then when inevitably what we experience does not match up with what we've read in scriptures? How do we reconcile God's promises to Jeremiah with all this stuff that happens to him? How do we square God's holy covenant against all that has happened? What expectations do we place on the presence of God? We want the presence of God to appear like Superman to toss us aside safely as bullets ping off his chest. But that does not happen. We have experienced enough singular and collective trauma to know that God doesn't work that way. Then, exactly how does God work? Our understanding of God, our faith, can be thought of as a four-legged stool. On the seat is everything we believe about God. Each leg represents a contributing element to our faith development. These four legs are experience, tradition, reason, and scripture. This this metaphor of the four-legged stool comes from Anglican theologian Thomas Hooker. How these legs, experience, tradition, reason, and scripture are built and incorporated into our faith, they keep evolving. They are handed down generation by generation. And so by the time we step up to the lathe to take ownership of our individual faith, much has already been handed to us. A grandfather's prayer, a family wound, well-worn stories told at heirloom tables, Sunday school lessons, inspiring mountain vistas, they all contribute to the customizing of our faith. Therefore, faith formation formation of any individual is by necessity intergenerational, communal, and collaborative. However, as mostly white American Christians coming out of evangelical Protestantism, We have been encouraged to have a highly personal and individualized faith. Phrases like personal Lord and Savior and artifacts like the sinner's prayer have been built into our four-legged stools. We long for an interventionalist God because if God loves us, the individual, then God should surely save us personally from all that would harm or traumatize So when bad things happen, particularly to good people like us, our faith is shaken. God then becomes a sadist, the parent who traumatizes the child for no other reason than to test and teach. And who would want to be in a relationship with a God like that? The self-centering of Christianity has resulted in droves leaving the church with a bitter taste of hypocrisy and abandonment. But when we change our tune from Jesus loves me to he's got the whole world in his hands, 
We become more in tune with the community God intended for us. When our ancestors spoke about the divine, they spoke about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one person, but three patriarchs, representative of a whole people. Worship of this God did not happen in household shrines, but in places like the tabernacle and the temple, where the whole congregation could come and enact their rituals together. God, as revealed in Christ, took on flesh, took on the experiences of the common person. Jesus remains accessible and familiar to us, even these 2,000 years later. And the Holy Spirit, who we celebrated again just last week, she revealed herself to the disciples and the witnessing crowd in all languages, that they could come together as a diverse and mutually understanding of each other community of faith. God has always been most fully recognized in community, in relationship. The very nature of God, the Trinity, is a community. The first creation, Adam, Eve, creatures, is community. The worship of God is centered in a church, not the building, but the people in community. The presence of God is fully experienced in relationship, and so we must shift our reading of the scriptures from the, per, from the second person singular to the second person plural. Do not be afraid. I am with y'all, and I will rescue y'all. If God is with us as a group, when grief strikes one of us, we can find the presence of God in our community. We are not left on a limb or out in the cold waiting for Superman to show up. Instead, we are invited to partake in the presence and blessing of God. The blessing is as close as the person sitting next to us. The presence is as real as our connections of affection and kindness. When we feel out of touch with God because the devastation is too great, our community brings the touch of God to us. We hold each other in the light of God's love so that no one walks through dark valleys alone. In the past, this communal presence of God has looked like gathering in hospital rooms and at gravesides. It has looked like pray, praying together by candlelight and sharing meals in each other's homes. In the past year, we have adapted into sharing God's presence by way of postal service and com computer screen. Our gatherings have moved to front porches, driveways, camp chairs. In the future, we may yet again explore new ways to accompany and support each other to mourn and to celebrate in the spirit of the one who binds us together. I want to close by bringing our attention back to Jeremiah. I want to tell you how his story ends. Instead of looking over Jeremiah's shoulder at the smoldering destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah tells us about the king, the king Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin, all these kings have very similar names. This one's Jehoiachin. He is taken into captivity. He is put into prison. And almost immediately, he is released from prison. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, invites Jehoiakim to sit at his table, to dine with him. Nebuchadnezzar gives Jehoiakim an allowance and protection for the rest of his life. And these are words of hope. These are words of hope because Jeremiah wants, us to leave, wants to leave us with this little nugget. Not the fire and smoke, but hope. Though it appears that all is lost, that the enemy has won, God remains, even working through unlikely people like Nebuchadnezzar, God remains. There is every reason for return for restoration, and for regrowth. It's a little nugget of hope. My friends, there is no going back to normal for us. 
We have lost too many people. Too much has changed for us to go back to where we were. But we are so much more than a remnant. We have this body, this community, who has shown up and pulled through, who has been the presence of God to us and will continue to be so. Let us direct our gaze toward the future. We have every reason to hope. God is with y'all and will rescue y'all. Look around. Look around. Make eye contact with each other. Say to one another, you are a reason for hope. My friends, may the one who is in us and among us strengthen our hope day by day, person by person. God is with us. Amen. Friends, we come now to a time of sharing our joys and our concerns. Please feel free to um, enter your joys or your concerns in our chat box. At our um, early worship this morning at nine o'clock, John Peck asked for prayers for his knee replacement surgery, which is happening June 14th. Um, he is joyful that he gets a chance to um, to have the surgery and is looking forward to all of the the good things that will it will bring him in terms of mobility and being pain free. Any other prayers this morning, Riley, that you can think of from this morning? Just lots of uh, prayers for uh just joyous family connections and being able to spend time with each other um, as, as we're able. And that's been, been on folks' minds. Absolutely. Also prayers for places in our world that are particularly hard hit by the COVID pandemic and those that are dealing with violence. We remember Gaza, um, and places throughout the world that are uh, suffering. Um, a few, this, this came up um, in our nine o'clock worship too. So we are, uh, we've embarked upon an interfaith garden collective here on our property. Um, we are partnering with the Unitarian Church the um, Temple Sinai, the local synagogue, and um, 
Dyer Phelps AME Church and um, a social justice organization called Zedek Garden Collective. And um, they had their first garden work day yesterday and it went very well. And Kathy Hargis lifts up here the joy of participating in the garden. Um, Paul Phillips, who was at the nine o'clock service said the same thing. So I am glad that uh, relationships are growing right here as well as um, things are getting planted, which is wonderful. This morning, we also remember the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre of whites burning down what, what, what was essentially uh, Black Wall Street in Oklahoma and thus setting back um, Black business and wealth redistribution post-Civil War for, for decades. And so we remember that violence and we, we recognize our benefit from it and um, pray for race relations in this country that um, the stories we tell are true. We also um, see that Kathy Hargis is asking continued prayers for her friend, friend Ruthie as she goes through chemo. Peg and Cammie, who are sisters, ask for prayer for their brother, John, who's in the veteran hospital in, in Albany. He has a severe bacteria in his heel. Um, we pray his foot won't have to be amputated. Absolutely. So prayers for, for John as well. Okay. Seeing no other prayers, let us join our hearts together in prayer at this time. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, on this rainy day, we give thanks for the warmth in our lives, for the brightness of your light and the light of the faith community that we are a part of. God, we lift up all of the concerns that we have named and those we have not named as well, those that are in our hearts. We lift all of that up to you to tend to them as only you can tend to them. God, we particularly this morning remember all those who are affected by violence and war, who are still struggling through this pandemic. We pray for people who are um, questioning science, that we might have a renewed level of trust. God, we pray for um, families that haven't seen each other in so long and for for safe traveling to be together, especially on this weekend, God. And we pray with, um, with much concern for our leaders, for those who are um, seemingly unable to reach any sort of agreement. We pray for truth to shine through and for um, goodness and justice to prevail. God, we also share our joy with you this morning and all those things in our hearts that we are grateful for and that our joy we lift up to you as well. God, we give you thanks that you don't just call us individuals, but you call us y'all, that we are part of a larger thing than just our individual selves, that we are part of your creation and your people. We give you deep thanks for that, God. We also give you thanks for Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, now is our time of sharing our gratitudes. Pastor Riley, what is your gratitude this morning? I am grateful for hammocks. Hmm. We we just finally set our hammock up earlier this month. And um, both Rachel and I have napped in the hammock. And that's a particularly sweet sort of nap. What are you grateful for? Oh, nice. Um. I'm grateful for the rain. As much as I wanted to spend the weekend outdoor gardening, I know that we really, really desperately needed this rain. So I, um, I am grateful for it. Definitely. Excellent. 
Trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> the Zancellis have moved and they write that they are grateful for their new home. I'm also sure you are grateful to have that move behind you. So that is wonderful. What other um, gratitudes do we have this morning, friends? We know they're out there. So I'm also grateful as I, because I'm sure people are just writing in the chat box and I want it to catch up. Um, I got to go out to brunch with my husband on our 14th wedding anniversary on Thursday, um, which was awesome. And we got to take a very long walk, which was also really nice. But it was the first time that he and I had been out to eat together since before the pandemic. So that was, um, that was very nice. All right. Uh, Julie's grateful for her snoring dog. <laughs> Christine's grateful for peonies about to bloom. Kathy's grateful for brothers who are working together as we speak to replace two major items at their camp. That's wonderful. Rebecca's grateful for seeing friends in person. Good, good, good. All right. Let us pray. Dear God, for all these things and so much more. Thank you. Amen. Um, announcements. So we, we talked about this in our, in our prayers a little bit about this new, um, interfaith garden. Um, they are, they are meeting again this coming Monday, Memorial so tomorrow. Day, tomorrow. Thank you. From one to four. And we'll be working on planting the three beds that they dug yesterday and the trellis areas. If more time is needed Wednesday, they will meet from three to six. And this is a y'all come kind of thing. You don't have to know anything about gardening. You don't have to stay for the whole time. If you can only give half an hour, an hour, come anyway. Um, see what we're up to. Um, we would, if you want to come on Monday, please let Kathy Hargis know. Her phone number is 518-692. 7636. You can also email the front office at office at pnecchurch.org. And I'm sure Julie can let Kathy know that you are coming. Um, Riley, I'm really, really excited about next Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Next Sunday, we will be ushering in the month of pride, remembrance and celebration with guest preacher Robin Dalbaum. We are also going to be meeting in person at 1045 and live streaming the service. Um, so if you're not ready to come back to the building yet, we love you and we are grateful for you to do whatever you're comfortable with. And so we will make sure that you have the link for the live stream. And uh, Molly is, or Molly, Robin is married to Molly. Molly is uh, a member of Albany Presbytery and is working at First Presbyterian in Albany. Robin, who is joining us as our guest preacher, is ordained UCC. So they're a UCC Presbyterian family, which is just perfect for us. Like us. Yeah. And so uh, we're excited to welcome Robin into worship. And I've gone ahead and purchased a little bit of pride swag for you. So when you come in, there's little, be little presents for you to pick up. Um, Kate, can I talk about the rest of June? Yeah, please do. So in June, our worship is um, really unique. There's something happening every Sunday. So on June 13, we will be having a, a really special service of grief and remembrance, where we're going to invite those who have lost someone in the last 15 or 16 months to, to share uh, with us in a, in a really particular way. And there's going to be emails and instructions about this, but we're just going to pause in our lives together and to spend some, some real time in memory and in prayers for, for those who are grieving. And then on June 20, our graduating high school seniors will be joining us and we will be hearing from them. And then on June 27th, after the service, 
Um, we invite you to bring your own picnic and camp chairs or blankets or whatever, and we'll spend some time outside fellowshipping together. Wonderful. Uh, Lynn Flanagan, you just asked when we need to download a special app for the future live stream services. You will not. Uh, that's these these services will live stream on Facebook and, and YouTube too, right? I mean, yes, not Facebook, just YouTube. Okay. Um, and all the all the links would be one week. One link would be the same every week. That live stream will also be recorded and put on our website. So even if you can't watch in the moment, it'll be, should you want to watch church later or again, it'll be there for you. Wonderful. So next week, 1045 is our service. So don't sign in on at 11 or you might miss some of the opening components. Um, 1045, one service. Great. Any other announcements? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. All it's right. Gonna, it seems like a plenty for now. <laughs> June's going to be a good month. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, Pastor Riley, will you offer us our benediction? I will. I will. Friends, hear this blessing for you this day and for the rest of your and for the rest of your days. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Holy Spirit join us together as one body, as one community. May we be the presence of God to one another as we are bound together by the Lord Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Riley. And we have the postlude for you played um, at our nine o'clock service. I think you'll enjoy it.